we come carrying just what we need for the journey. We come bringing whatever we have to offer. We come knowing God will multiply our offerings. Let us worship God. confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Knowing that great and sure hope, let us now together in unison pray our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Generous God, you freely offer us all we need. You offer us the bread of life so we may never be hungry again. You offer us living water as we will never thirst. We scoff at your gifts, wasting our money, time, and energy on things that do not satisfy. Forgive us and call us again, reminding us of your gifts of new life that are ours if we would only accept them. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, sinners just like you and sinners just like me. He personally bore with his body on the cross our sin so that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that's fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. Here we go for the bunny money. It's my turn for the thought of the week, or should I say several thoughts? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> the thought of the week. I thought that we would be fun to play a game that everybody knows today. And you can stay in your seats because I'm not going to, we could, not going to be too strenuous here. It's the game, I know you know it, it's Simon Says. Who doesn't know Simon Says? 
Good. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Simon says to raise your left hand. Okay. You know, one of the interesting things about Simon Says is a game that's lasted through the centuries, or decades, I should say, and always is popular. Go ahead and put your hand down. I got you. <laughs> it only took one, just one time of this astute. <laughs> oh, I got you. Simon Says is a game with a point, and my thought for the week is simply this. In life, you always have to follow someone. There's going to be someone who's going to be your Simon. And I guess the question is, well, you need to avoid the fact to think that you're Simon and everything, because we're all human beings. But you're going to follow somebody, and so am I. And I'm here to just give the thought, by far the best person you can possibly follow, give your life to, is Jesus Christ. So next time you play Simon Says with your grandkids, <laughs> tell them the moral of the game. That it is very important who you follow. Thank you. There's a story behind today's text. You see, often when I begin to prepare sermons, I always, of course, consult the lectionary page. And it goes back and forth about what's first. But uh, for this Sunday, the lectionary page is the, the common lectionary that's put out by the uh, Methodist and Anglican and Episcopal folks. And in that, we have this verse here from, uh, from uh, Luke, which is the story of the Transfiguration. And I thought, that's weird. Why is the transfiguration uh, here in the middle of August for them? And I verified it because I went, the very next thing is the revised uh, lectionary, the, the, the new revised lectionary. And of course, they had it in where I preached it or just a few months ago, um, the week before Lent. And that is Transfiguration Sunday. So I was thinking, why in the world do our Anglican and Methodist brothers and sisters put the transfiguration text here? And I felt challenged. So I'm an honorary Methodist today. <laughs> and I'm going to take this as a challenge to try and say something. Um, um, well, try to say something. <laughs> but before we turn to the text in the sermon, let us turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, we pray that your spirit would descend upon this place with power and that your word would be delivered with full, full assurance through the Holy Spirit and in the strong name of Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. Like I say, I take as our text this morning the ninth chapter of Luke's gospel, beginning with the 28th verse. Let us now reverently attend to the reading of God's holy word as I take this from the New Revised Standard Version of the Scripture. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure when he's about to accomplish, what he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory, and the two men stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of these things they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back in the day, 
when I didn't use the lectionary so much and sort of picked scriptures myself, this would be one I would tend to avoid most of the time. Because it's just so otherworldliness, so hard to describe. The only time I really dealt with it was a few times uh, where it was before Lent. You know, the season where you're supposed to get serious about your flaws and your sins and, and about the darkness in the world and, and how this always came before. And often I would preach this two ways. And most of my brethren and sister and pastors would do the same. The first way is a mountaintop experience like the Transfiguration is good, but you can't stay up there very long. You've got to get down back in the valley and the muck and the mire and the darkness and all the stuff going on, you know, so enjoy the mountain for five minutes, but you've got to get back down. And often that was coupled with the fact that right next is that mess with the demon-possessed boy and the father who Mark says, I believe, help my unbelief, and the disciples are having trouble with curing it. It's just a mess down there. You've got to leave the mountaintop and go down to the mess. Because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, frankly, I, one of my very favorite paintings, it's in the Vatican Museums, I saw it one time when I was 17 years old, is the great painting, it's his, they consider they, maybe his last painting before he passed away, uh, Raphael's The Transfiguration. The, the amazing thing about that is it's sort of two paintings in one. Because in the top half of the painting you have that erethial picture of the transfiguration. In fact, Moses and Elijah are sort of floating in the air. But down in the lower third of the painting, you have the father in agony and the demon-possessed boy and the disciples and arguing and confused. The, the lower half of the painting is just a depiction of the troubles of the world. And the amazing thing about the painting is you're drawn, not to the top half, but to the stuff going on down below. And so we often go that way. Or we concentrate on old Peter. Poor Peter. <laughs> he gets to be the brunt of so many of our sermons. Usually they're not in too positive a light, because Peter's like a bull in a china closet. And a lot of times he gets stuff right, but then all of a sudden, you know, he goes too far, he crosses the line, or he, he says, you know, just the wrong thing. In this passage right before this, Jesus asks who people say that I am. And Peter says he's so right, you know, he, he gets it. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the guy who's going to conquer Rome for us, the guy who's going to establish a new kingdom for us. And Jesus acknowledges that, but when Jesus says he's going to go to Jerusalem and die, Peter can't take it, and Jesus gets all upset at Pete. Get behind me, Satan. Pretty rough with him. And now here, we got Peter on the mountaintop. He's the only one who speaks. And granted, the scripture says, the text says he's confused. They're all confused by what they see. They're, you know, who wouldn't be? And he has this, let's build three tents in the Greek or in the Hebrew. Sort of like, okay, Jesus, we're going to be, we're, we want to stay here. This is summer camp, and we're going to build these tents, and we're just going to enjoy this moment privately just with us. And so often you can preach and say, you know, that silly Peter, he gets it wrong, but you know what? We're like Peter. And even though we're like Peter and we get it wrong, Still, Jesus accepted him, and, and he built his church on that flawed rock. I got thinking about that, those two ways, and I was wondering, is that all there is to this text? Especially, let's begin with Peter. It's not summer camp he's talking about. It's not home and tents he's talking about. He's not about having a picnic up there and looking at the stars at night. 
He's talking about the tent of meeting. In the Hebrew, the tent is a tabernacle. It's a place of worship. It's a place where you get on your knees and adore. He's not talking about summer camp. He's talking about worship. It's good that we're here. We can now worship you. And Peter never gives a timeline, does he? He never says, let's stay up here for three weeks. We preachers interject that in there. He just says it's good to be here. Just like the tabernacle, let us adore you and worship you. Now, this challenged me, and then I realized something. Jesus Christ is never one not to answer something, never one to let a mistake go. He just did it with Peter before, get behind me, Satan. He always responds. And I did some checking this week. You know, you can still miss stuff in the Bible. You can be in your mid-60s like me, and I thought I knew everything in the Bible. Believe me, I don't. I miss this. This is the only time where a disciple makes an affirmation or says something that Jesus doesn't answer. There's no answer. Now, if what Peter said was so silly, so bad, if we're going to characterize it, why didn't Jesus say, Peter, you're wrong. We got to get down this mountain and hurry. We don't have time for tents. We don't have time for all this stuff that you want to do. Quit dodging, Peter. Quit dodging what we have to do. Why didn't Jesus address Peter's statement? Because it's quite a statement. And all of a sudden it hit me. For my whole life, I've been thinking about this text. That silly Peter, he's doing it again. He's leading with his mouth again. He's the bull in the china shop again. All of a sudden it hit me. What if Peter wasn't wrong in what he said? What if Peter wasn't wrong? And if something else hit me at the same time. Every time we preach this text, it's about getting off the mountain as quickly as possible to get down to the valley or it's about us silly human beings who have a wrong idea of what we should do. The one thing that, and I looked, I checked it out. The main subject of the sermon is not Peter. And it's not what's going to happen down in the valley. The main concern in this text is Jesus Christ. And what's happening to Jesus Christ. But that's hard to preach on. How do you preach on something like that? So we tend to make a mistake. You know, Ludwig Feuerbach, critic of Christianity. In fact, his book, The Essence of Christianity, uh, is a groundwork for Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in their atheism. And he was an anthropologist by trade who became a noted philosopher. He said in the essence of Christianity that the Bible has no theology, none at all. The Bible's just anthropology. God is nothing but a projection of ourselves. And we use the Bible to project ourselves. We use God to project ourselves. We're basically just egotistically, materialistically, Projecting ourselves. Well, we sort of do that with this text. We don't want to deal with the glory of the transfiguration. We want to get down to the human stuff. We want to talk about us and the world. You know, Peter, I think of him. Here's a disciple 
who refused to be crucified the same way Jesus was because he wasn't worthy. And so he was killed on an upside down cross. I read to Gene earlier this week all the ways the disciples killed themselves or were killed, I should say. They didn't kill themselves, how they were killed. Well, that's what Peter did. If Peter was alive, sitting in this pew today, and if I preached a sermon like I preached so many times before in this text, he'd tell me, how dare you? How dare you make me the subject of this sermon? This sermon is about Jesus Christ. We tend to do that with the parables, you know. We take a terrible, the kingdom of God, and we make it about ourselves. Deal with ourselves. Peter wasn't wrong. He was lost in wonder, love, and praise as he saw that. As he saw the uncreated light of God and glory come down and assume the one who he had known for a few months now as a disciple who had dirty feet and was a human being just like him. He had seen the glory of God coming through this one man. You notice I said the uncreated light of God? You see, dear friends, in the creation story, when God says, let there be light, and there was light, he's talking about the sunlight out there. But we believe that God created ex nihilo. That means God created out of nothing. That means there was no something before God. There was no pre-existent material before God. So, the light of God is just a part of who God is. It's part of the Lord's essence. It's glory. And it drives you to your knees. And it confuses you. So you say maybe some stuff that seems a little silly at times. To see the human being, Jesus Christ, all of a sudden transfigured into the glory of God, that's the heart of our faith. That's the mystery of our faith. That God and Jesus are one. And to say it's good that we are here to worship and adore when you see Jesus Christ in his glory is never bad. In fact, it's important. It's what we're called to do. There's a, a stained glass window in New York City and a great preacher of the past, George Buttrick, uh, mentioned in one of his sermons it was a window by Tiffany in New York City. And it was a depiction of the holy city coming down and all from Revelation, all the gold streets and the diamond sidewalks and the, all the beautiful, the aquamarine river of life and that kind of thing. And the people of the church didn't like it because they said that may be Tiffany's depiction of this, but we live in New York City. Dusty, grimy, earthy, New York City. Well, you know, something happened with that stained window as the decades went on. It began to fade. The colors began to fade just a little bit. And all of a sudden, you're able to see through the glorious work of Tiffany and that wonderful stained glass, you got to see the shadow then of the skyscrapers and the city it was and how the glory of God was shining down into the midst of the city.
It's never wrong. In fact, it's needed to worship and adore the glorified Christ because the heart of our faith is is in that transfigured light, that glory of God through the Holy Spirit, that we become transfigured ourselves. Where does transformation take place? If not through contact with the glory of God through the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Rather than running down the mountain, we need to keep going up all the time to get closer and closer and closer and closer to that our glorious Savior, who became one of us so that we could be transfigured and be united with him. And I tell you what, if you don't go down from the mountain transfigured, if you don't seek to shine with the same light that Christ had, well, then we're not worth much. The Rotary Club is a good one. I belong. They do good things in the dark city. To be fair, so do the Elks. <laughs> or Jackie Gleason, the Moose Club. <laughs> There's all sorts of great charities that you can join that does good things. But that's not what the Christian's called to do. Dear ones, we are the body of Christ who are supposed to shine the light of Christ as we go down the mountain. And we only do that when we go up it. To be in his presence. And to bask in his glory. And to know that death is not the final answer. To know that sinful though we be, through Christ, we are dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Peter may have been confused, but he was right. He was wrong about one thing. He didn't need three tabernacles. There in the vision before him, Jesus Christ is the temple. Destroy this and I'll raise it again in three days. He is the light. He is the one we worship and adore. Don't be so quick to leave the Mount of Transfiguration. Stay there so you can be a little bit transfigured yourself when you go down it. My Anglican and Episcopal brothers and the Methodist brothers are not wrong in this. And it's okay to preach it before Lent. But I like it here. So I'm going to close with a great Methodist hymn that we Presbyterians like. By Mr. Wesley. Samuel Wesley. Finish then thy new creation pure and spotless let us be let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee lost in wonder love and praise that is what the Mount of Transfiguration teaches us, dear friends. Amen. Let us now rise and reaffirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward? God, we pray that you would transform us so that we would be even more grateful, more generous, more giving. We thank you for these gifts, for the hands that gave them, and for the work of this church. We dedicate them in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please be seated. My dear friends, this is the table of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he invites us to come, not because we must, but because we can. Not because we have any claim of righteousness or justification, but only because he invites us. Here is gracious words of invitation to you when he said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Here is invitation to you when he says, I am the bread of life. He who believes in me will never hunger. The one who comes to me will never thirst. Behold, the one who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Dear friends, let us now reverently attend to the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord as we share once again the words of Paul to the church in Corinth when he writes, I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he supped, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come again. And now in his name, I take these elements to be set apart with prayer and thanksgiving for the use that he's appointed them. Let us pray. With this bread broken, Lord, we eat an invisible loaf given each day in pieces no larger than our need, the broken bread of your glory shining in the common thing, the broken bread of much nurturing and appropriating this, your word, the broken bread of your life, sanctifying the deeds and dreams through your cross for us, the broken bread of humiliation, purging us of pride and pretense, the broken bread of your joy glimmering in all the beauty and wonder of the broken lights of eternity through days and nights, through flowers and stars, through age and infancy, through mercy and faith. With such broken bread we come to the table of him whose life was broken that ours might be mended to shine at last with his spirit in the doing of your will on earth where all things are incomplete until the blessing comes upon them and they are as they are in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Remember the prayer he taught us when he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he supped, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it, for as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come again. 
All is now ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Christ broken for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are so grateful for what you've done for us, how in Christ you came down to become one of us, to restore us. Help us remember that the depth of that sacrifice, the breadth of that love, the commitment that this table means. And may we leave here changed, having a touch of your glory. This we ask in Christ's name, amen.
here, I charge you to remember, dear friends, no matter where you are in this life, whether it be a mountaintop or a valley, there is no limit on being lost in wonder, love, and praise in the presence of Jesus Christ. In fact, through the work of the Holy Spirit, it's encouraged. And now go in peace. Live as free women and free men in all that you do. Do the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now to the only God, be all glory and power, dominion and majesty, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.